First Testament lesson is from the book of Isaiah 24, 4 through 13. You can follow along in your pew Bibles on page 651. The earth dries up, listen for the word of the Lord. The earth dries up and withers, the world languishes and withers. The heavens languish together with the earth. The earth lies polluted under its inhabitants, and for they have transgressed laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth dwindled, and few people are left. The wine dries up, the vine languishes, all the merry-hearted sigh, the mirth of the timbarus is stilled. The noise of the jubilant has ceased. The mirth of the lyre is stilled. No longer do they drink the wine with singing. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The city of chaos is broken down. Every house is shut up so that no one can enter. There is an outcry in the streets for lack of wine. All joy is reached, it has reached its eventide. The gladness of the earth is banished. Desolation is left in the city. The gates are battered into ruins. For thus it shall be on earth and among the nations as when an olive leaf, olive tree is beaten as at the gleaning when the grape harvest is ended. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We begin a new sermon series today during Lent. As you can see from the bulletin, it's called Repent, and we're going to be looking at repentance, what it is, what it means, how do we go about doing it. Uh, the New Testament text this morning is out of the book of Hebrews, which is not one of those great books that most of us spend much time at all looking at. But uh, the Hebrews is actually a, a letter that is written to a community in the first century who is being persecuted for their faith. They're being persecuted, arrested for being Christians. And so they're, they're struggling with whether to stay faithful or to go back to their old way of life, their pre-Christian way of life. And so that is part of the context of this story. And and what you're going to hear, though, are words of encouragement. So let us listen to the word of the Lord. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others, though, were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made whole or complete. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross disregarding its shame and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. 
So what should we remember? What sort of history should we tell? I, I realize that sounds like perhaps kind of a strange question. I mean, isn't history just history is history? But right now, around the world, there is a struggle going on having to do with the purpose of history and what kind of history we ought to be telling. And, and it's not just here in the United States, as I'll point out in, in a few minutes, but the, the struggle with how you tell history is, and, and the two names that, that have sort of come to me are, do you tell civic history or do you tell scientific history? So what's the difference? Civic history also goes by the name of patriotic history. And those who tell civic history say the only purpose of telling history is to create patriotism, love of country, love of nation, having people be proud of the nation in which they live. And so to tell that kind of history, what happens is you, you minimize the things that are sort of negative about your country and you only tell the good stuff. Think about it, sort of like good stuff history. Scientific history, on, on the other hand, is, well, think about a scientist. A scientist generally comes at their task without any preconceived uh, political agenda. They, they just want to get the facts. If you're a geologist, you want to know what kind of mineral or rock it is. You want to know how it's, what it's composed of. Same thing if you're a chemist. So scientific history is you tell everything you tell not just the good stuff, but you tell the bad stuff. The stuff that's hard for people to hear. And, and one way to uh, sort of wrap our heads around this, and I was going to talk about the United States, but I knew as soon as I did I would create more heat than light. <laughs> so we're going to talk about an, uh, what's going on in the nation of Zimbabwe. And, and they are actually having this debate as we speak, okay? How many of you are familiar at all with Zimbabwe? Some, okay. Uh, Zimbabwe is a nation in Africa that used to be called Rhodesia. That when the nation gained its independence um, from Great Britain, essentially the whites took power just like they did in South Africa. They had a racist, essentially apartheid government but then the blacks led by Robert Mugabe began a revolution, a guerrilla war. And over a long period of time, they fought the white forces until they reached a peace agreement and they reached a settlement of shared power between blacks and whites. And they changed the name of the country to Zimbabwe. So right now, they're trying to decide how they should tell history to their people. Those who want civic history say that all you talk about is the glorious revolution, the, the, the leader, the great leader, Robert Mugabe, and how he led the forces to victory and how the nation was changed and transformed. Okay? Civic pride, pride in the nation and in the party and in the leader. On the other hand, though, you have people who want to tell scientific history. They want to say, well, yeah, there was this glorious revolution, but then when Mugabe came to power, there was political oppression. His friends were enriched. His enemies were imprisoned. We want to talk about the corruption. We want to talk about how people were starving in the streets, and Robert Mugabe spent more than a million dollars on a birthday party. We want to talk about hyperinflation, more than a thousand percent a month at one point. We want to tell the whole story. So, and, and, and this is, again, this is what's happening in the United States. This is what's happening around the world. So the question is, if we are Christians, okay, if we're Christians, what sort of stories ought we to tell? What ought we to remember? What kind of history should we share? Well, if you look to the biblical writers, the answer is both. 
The biblical writers tell both kinds of history. Because only by telling both kinds of history can you find repentance, and in repentance, faithfully follow Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Only by telling both kinds of history can you bring about repentance, and by repentance, faithfully follow Jesus Christ. Okay, so to understand that, we need to understand what repentance is. Repentance is a process composed of two steps. Remorse and return. Remorse and return. And, and both words, whether it's Greek or Hebrew, the words for repentance carry both of those images, both that emotional image of remorse and that idea of return. Okay? Remorse and return. Let's start with remorse. Now, I doubt that any of you have ever said something or done something you regret. <laughs> or maybe you didn't do something or didn't say something for which you carry a sense of remorse. I wish I, if, if you are that category, I wish I were you because I can't say that about me. As I look back on my life, there are plenty of times when I should have spoken up and didn't, or when I've said something that came out of my mouth and it was like, why did you say that? When I've hurt someone or allowed someone to be hurt. Right, and so if you think about remorse, remorse is to come to us when we have, and, and I want you to think about this image of the way, the path, that God gives us an image or a way or a path that we are to follow. And the path is what leads to life. It leads into the heart of God. It leads to life. And so what happens is when we do that, when we do something for which we're remorseful, it literally means we've wandered off the path and we bring harm rather than help, hatred rather than love, and so that's why remorse is important, because remorse tells us that we've left the path. That's what it's good for. It's not there to shame us. It's there to tell us, yes, you, you've wandered off, you've hurt someone, you've brought harm. All right, so that's the first part. The second part then, remorse, return. The second part of this is to return. Okay? And so, what that means is, you've wandered off the path. The second part of repentance is to return to the path. It is to move back onto the way for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, to love and to compassion and to forgiveness and to sharing and to serving. It is, it is to return to the way. And so, if we are to do that, if we are to move ourselves from being off the path to back on the path, then repentance is that critical process. And the Bible tells stories that are intended to bring remorse and stories that are intended to encourage us to the return. So I'm going to read a little bit of this Isaiah passage again, and then I'll let you decide which is this. Is this a remorse passage? Is this a return passage? Okay, so I'm just going to read a piece of it. The earth dries up and withers, the world languishes and withers, the heavens languish together with the earth. The earth lies polluted under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant, Desolation is left in the city. The gates are battered into ruins. For thus it shall be on the earth and among nations. Regret, return. Regret? Yeah, it's regret. Because the, the context of this passage, okay, these aren't just sort of words out in the ether. The context of this passage is the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Babylonians. Because 
Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed not just because Babylon happened to show up. Babylon had been around for a while and things were going okay. It was that the leadership in Jerusalem decided that they could ignore all of God's laws. They could mistreat the poor. They could abuse the widow. They could enslave their own people. And then they could ignore the words of the prophets who said, don't rebel against Babylon. And they said, no, God loves us. We can do anything we want. So we're going to rebel against Babylon and we'll be safe. Yeah, no. The nation was destroyed. The people were exiled. This, this is a cause for remorse. This is for the people to say, wow, look what happened when we wandered off the path. It's to, it's to bring remorse so they don't do it again. All right, second passage. And I realize most of you probably don't know who all these people are, but hang in there. And what more should I say? For time would fail to tell me of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions. Okay? Scientific, civic. Civic? Civic. This, this is encouraging remembering. And it's encouraging remembering because all of those people that were named, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets... None of these were perfect people. These were people who all messed up. They were all people who wandered off the path. But they found repentance. And they returned to the way. And in returning to the way, they were able to do great things for God and great things for God's people. This is a word of encouragement. This is to build up the people who received this letter, who were fearful of being persecuted and imprisoned and possibly killed. They said, no, 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 look. There are those who've gone before you. There's this great cloud of witnesses who faced down everything you're facing and they succeeded even if they weren't perfect people. This is the kind of history that inspires and encourages. And so that's our challenge. Our, our challenge, not just in the, the greater scheme of our faith, but in our personal faith. It is to remember both kinds of history. It's to remember those times when we have wandered off the path and fallen short and feel remorse. I really did blow it. But it's not to stay there. It's not to stay there. It is then to remember those times when we have done well, when we have been faithful when we know we can be faithful again and we return to the way of Christ. So that's my challenge to all of us for this week. It is to remember the good, the bad, and everything in between for the sole purpose of helping us return to the way of Christ, to loving God, and loving neighbor. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you never leave us off the path, that you call to us, that you seek us, that you draw us back, and that you help us to remember that on the path or off the path, we always belong to you. We give you thanks for this in Christ's name. Amen.